The Great Exhibition ran from the 1st of May to the 15th of October 1851. To accompany our VR simulation of the exhibition, to be released free of charge in September 2024, we have created a five-part video series about the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations. Among Prince Albert's interests, he became President of the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce, also known as the Society of Arts, in 1843. There had been a number of successful French national exhibitions from 1798 onwards, viewed with interest from north of the English Channel. And so, in 1845 the Society of Arts formed a committee to pursue the idea of their own exhibitions. Henry Cole joined the Society in 1846 and he worked with Prince Albert and other members of the Society to hold a series of exhibitions of British manufacture in the Great Room of the Society's House in 1847, 1848 and 1849. They became increasingly more popular, the 1847 exhibition attracting 20,000 visitors, the 1849 exhibition 100,000 visitors. A meeting in June 1849 confirmed the intention to hold an international exhibition and recommended the formation of a royal commission headed by Prince Albert. This commission was formed in January 1850 less than 18 months before the opening ceremony of the Great Exhibition. One of the first acts of the commission was to establish a committee for all matters relating to the building. After a month of deliberation they suggested two locations in Hyde Park and one in Regent's Park which were large enough to accommodate the exhibition. The Chief Commissioner of Her Majesty's Woods and Forests indicated there would be significant objection to one of the sites in Hyde Park, the northeast corner, but not the other, the south of Hyde Park, which was the site adopted. The next decision was to seek, by public competition, a design for the building. This competition was published the 13th of March 1850, with only one month allowed for designs to be submitted. Nevertheless, 233 designs were received. These were duly considered, and a report was published on the 9th of May 1850, which decided none of the designs were suitable. Instead, the committee published their own design. Some aspects of this design are familiar in the Crystal Palace which was eventually built, avenues 48 foot wide, supporting columns spaced at 24 foot. These dimensions were considered appropriate for dividing exhibition counters and passages. Open courts were left for the preservation of trees, these being allocated for refreshment areas. Detailed drawings were prepared by the end of June, which were then offered for contractors to tender for the construction of this building. However, the design proved most unpopular. There were objections about potential cost, difficulty to erect in the available time, and potential delays in removal of what had been promised to be a temporary building, not least due to the large quantity of bricks required. Nevertheless, 19 tenders were received by the deadline of the 10th of July 1850, although only eight of these were for the whole works. However, additionally Messrs Fox Henderson and Company presented a tender based on a different design by Mr Joseph Paxton. This was the Crystal Palace almost as built, the only difference being Paxton's initial design showed the transept roof as flat, which would have required the loss of the trees in this part of the building. Mr Paxton clearly understood marketing. He had published his design in the Illustrated London News and had gained a favourable response from the public. The Royal Commission appeared to have been immediately impressed with the design, partly due to the almost total absence of bricks, and so, on the 16th of July 1850, Fox and Henderson's tender for Mr. Paxton's design was accepted, with one change, the arched roof of the transept was added to avoid the loss of some of the old elm trees. Look out for the next video in this series, where we look at the construction of the building.